Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Robinson in Birmingham, Alabama. Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. An Opinion of the United States Supreme Court. Decided on May 17, 1954. Please note, for ease of listening, this reading omits legal citations and footnotes found within the text of the Court's opinion. Mr. Chief Justice Warren delivered the opinion of the Court. These cases come to us from the states of Kansas, South Carolina, Virginia, and Delaware. They are premised on different facts and different local conditions, but a common legal question justifies their consideration together in this consolidated opinion. In each of the cases, minors of the Negro race, through their legal representatives, seek the aid of the courts in obtaining admission to the public schools of their community on a non-segregated basis. In each instance, they have been denied admission to schools attended by white children under laws requiring or permitting segregation according to race. This segregation was alleged to deprive the plaintiffs of the equal protection of the laws under the 14th Amendment. In each of the cases other than the Delaware case, a three-judge federal district court denied relief to the plaintiffs on the so-called separate but equal doctrine announced by this court in Plessy v. Ferguson. Under that doctrine, equality of treatment is accorded when the races are provided substantially equal facilities, even though these facilities be separate. In the Delaware case, the Supreme Court of Delaware adhered to that doctrine, but ordered that the plaintiffs be admitted to the white schools because of their superiority to the Negro schools. The plaintiffs contend that segregated public schools are not equal and cannot be made equal, and that hence they are deprived of the equal protection of the laws. Because of the obvious importance of the question presented, the court took jurisdiction. Argument was heard in the 1952 term, and re-argument was heard this term on certain questions propounded by the court. Re-argument was largely devoted to the circumstances surrounding the adoption of the 14th Amendment in 1868. It covered exhaustively consideration of the amendment in Congress, ratification by the states, then existing practices in racial segregation, and the views of the proponents and opponents of the amendment. This discussion and our own investigation convince us that although these sources cast some light, it is not enough to resolve the problem with which we are faced. At best, they are inconclusive. The most avid proponents of the post-war amendments undoubtedly intended them to remove all legal distinctions among all persons born or naturalized in the United States. Their opponents, just as certainly, were antagonistic to both the letter and the spirit of the amendments, and wished them to have the most limited effect. What others in Congress and the state legislatures had in mind cannot be determined with any degree of certainty. An additional reason for the inconclusive nature of the amendments' history with respect to segregated schools is the status of public education at that time. In the South, the movement toward free common schools supported by general taxation had not yet taken hold. Education of white children was largely in the hands of private groups. Education of Negroes was almost non-existent, and practically all of the race were illiterate. In fact, any education of Negroes was forbidden by law in some states. Today, in contrast, many Negroes have achieved outstanding success in the arts and sciences as well as in the business and professional world. It is true that public school education at the time of the amendment had advanced further in the North, but the effect of the amendment on Northern states was generally ignored in the Congressional debates. 
even in the north the conditions of public education did not approximate those existing today the curriculum was usually rudimentary ungraded schools were common in rural areas the school term was but three months a year in many states and compulsory school attendance was virtually unknown as a consequence it is not surprising that there should be so little in the history of the fourteenth amendment relating to its intended effect on public education in the first cases in this court construing the fourteenth amendment decided shortly after its adoption the court interpreted it as prescribing all state imposed discriminations against the negro race the doctrine of separate but equal did not make its appearance in this court until eighteen ninety six in the case of plessy versus ferguson involving not education but transportation american courts have since labored with the doctrine for over half a century in this court there have been six cases involving the separate but equal doctrine in the field of public education in cumming versus board of education of richmond county and gong loom versus rice the validity of the doctrine itself was not challenged in more recent cases all on the graduate school level inequality was found in that specific benefits enjoyed by white students were denied to negro students of the same educational qualifications in none of these cases was it necessary to re-examine the doctrine to grant relief to the negro plaintiff and in sweat versus painter the court expressly reserved decision on the question whether plessy versus ferguson should be held inapplicable to public education in the instant cases that question is directly presented here unlike sweat versus painter there are findings below that the negro and white schools involved have been equalized or are being equalized with respect to buildings curricula qualifications and salaries of teachers and other tangible factors our decision therefore cannot turn on merely a comparison of these tangible factors in the negro and white schools involved in each of the cases we must look instead to the effect of segregation itself on public education in approaching this problem we cannot turn the clock back to eighteen sixty eight when the amendment was adopted or even to eighteen ninety six when plessy versus ferguson was written we must consider public education in the light of its full development and its present place in american life throughout the nation only in this way can it be determined if segregation in public schools deprives these plaintiffs of the equal protection of the laws today education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments compulsory school attendance laws and the great expenditures for education both demonstrate our recognition of the importance of education to our democratic society it is required in the performance of our most basic public responsibilities even service in the armed forces it is the very foundation of good citizenship today it is a principal instrument in awakening the child to cultural values in preparing him for later professional training and in helping him to adjust normally to his environment in these days it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education such an opportunity where the state has undertaken to provide it is a right which must be made available to all on equal terms we come then to the question presented does segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors may be equal deprive the children of the minority group of equal educational opportunities we believe that it does in sweat versus painter in finding that a segregated law school for negroes could not provide them equal educational opportunities this court relied in large part on those qualities which are incapable of objective measurement but which make for greatness in a law school in mclaurin versus oklahoma state regents the court in requiring that a negro admitted to a white graduate school be treated like all other students again resorted to intangible considerations his ability to study 
to engage in discussions and exchange views with other students, and in general to learn his profession. Such considerations apply with added force to children in grade in high schools. To separate them from others of similar age and qualifications, solely because of their race, generates a feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. The effect of this separation on their educational opportunities was well stated by a finding in the Kansas case by a court which nevertheless felt compelled to rule against the Negro plaintiffs. Segregation of white and colored children in public schools has a detrimental effect upon the colored children. The impact is greater when it has the sanction of the law, for the policy of separating the races is usually interpreted as denoting the inferiority of the Negro group. A sense of inferiority affects the motivation of a child to learn. Segregation with the sanction of law, therefore, has a tendency to retard the educational and mental development of Negro children and to deprive them of some of the benefits they would receive in a racially integrated school system. Whatever may have been the extent of psychological knowledge at the time of Plessy versus Ferguson, this finding is amply supported by modern authority. Any language in Plessy versus Ferguson contrary to this finding is rejected. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Therefore, we hold that the plaintiffs and others similarly situated for whom the actions have been brought are by reason of the segregation complained of deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the fourteenth amendment this disposition makes unnecessary any discussion whether such segregation also violates the due process clause of the fourteenth amendment because these are class actions because of the wide applicability of this decision and because of the great variety of local conditions, the formulation of decrees in these cases presents problems of considerable complexity. On re-argument, the consideration of appropriate relief was necessarily subordinated to the primary question, the constitutionality of segregation in public education. We have now announced that such segregation is a denial of the equal protection of the laws. In order that we may have the full assistance of the parties in formulating decrees, the cases will be restored to the docket, and the parties are requested to present further argument on questions 4 and 5, previously propounded by the Court for the re-argument this term. The Attorney General of the United States is again invited to participate. The Attorneys General of the States requiring or permitting segregation in public education will also be permitted to appear as amici curiae upon request to do so by September 15, 1954, and submission of briefs by October 1, 1954. It is so ordered. End of Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, an opinion of the United States Supreme Court.